Aaron, how are you? I am very well. How are you? Good, good. Where are you based at the moment? I'm a, I'm in Portland now. In Portland, nice one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in I'm in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Well, we were just talking about uh, our uh, our linking, you know, but before the show, we we were we were good friends in a very different industry about seven eight years ago. We uh, we met um, in the CrossFit world. So right. there's so much to talk about, so much to catch up on. I think you and I have a lot of convergent interests, which I think is really really exciting. Um, but above all that, man, it's just great to see you again. It's just great to hang out. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. I, um, you know, I only keep in touch with so many people from, you know, my time in Australia. But it's I've been seeing sort of like peripherally, like some of the stuff that that you're doing. And, and it's awesome. Yeah, I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. Yeah, awesome, man. Appreciate that. So Tell me, so I think it was 2017, um, like we said before the show, that uh, we last saw each other. Um, perhaps start from there. I know, because I remember you were studying a psychology degree, I think, in Australia. Is that right? Is that mm -hmm. your undergrad was here? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it was kind of weird. I was in Australia for like about five years. And before coming to Australia, I had done a little bit of psychology study just like some random like undergrad stuff. And then um, sort of a weird series of events. I ended up like transferring all of the credits that I had to uh, Latrobe. And, and so I ended up doing uh, a bachelor's of psychological science at Latrobe. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I did psychological science at Latrobe. And then I graduated from there in 2016. And then I just worked as a clinician, um, mostly in substance use there for the next couple of years, whatever, on like a different visa. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where I left off. I worked at a place in Melbourne that is, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'd say famous, but it's a very reputable, um, one of the better, one of the better substance use treatment facilities i've ever seen and i've worked at a lot of them it's 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 called malvern private hospital oh, okay yeah yeah it's just over there it's in yeah it's in malvern east right. uh really really good private hospital for substance use so yeah did my undergrad there and then i worked as a clinician there uh for a couple of years yeah and uh what was your experience with psychological science because i've got a grad dip in psych science and i appreciate it don't get me wrong, <laughs> yeah. but I think most of us get into this sort of profession because we love the relationship between, you know, patient and clinician or client and clinician, uh, the yeah. phenomenal, ph phenomenological experience, which is obviously something you and I are going to speak to um, in depth in the show as well. Did you find the psych science undergrad sort of just a bit dry and, uh, you know, far too detached, I suppose, from what it's like to be a clinician? You know... <sighs> That's a, first of all, yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. And it's, it's crazy, you know, because my answer to that question over the years has dramatically ebbed and flowed. And what I can say is, so, okay. So when, like, when I first started studying psychology, I didn't know anything. Um, I had never really been to university before. I was like 25. And, uh, I, I started taking these like pretty basic psychology courses from this guy at a little small, like community college where I was living in Arizona at the time. And I remember I took a, I took a personality development, uh, personality development course. I took a developmental psychology course. And then I think I just took like a, just like an intro to psychology. And the dude who taught that course had a bent um, for humanistic psychology, existential psychotherapy. So dudes like uh, Rollo May, um, Abraham Maslow, um, uh, who else? Some of those guys, uh, Carl Rogers. Yeah, um, just Urban Yellow. 
Urban Yalom. Yeah, I didn't get Yalom yet, but eventually I got I got Yalom. Um, but so so this guy had like a he was in that sort of world, and he was tailoring fairly basic introductory psychology courses, sort of in that vein. And so that was like my initial uh, introduction to the field. And then I came to Australia. And then, you know, when you do a bachelor's of, I don't know if it's different in the States, you know, because I only did one undergrad, obviously, and I only did it there. But, you know, when I did my bachelor's of psychological science, I think at first I was a little skeptical and I was a little bit spooked by sort of trying to algorithmically like quantify human behavior. And I think maybe at first I was a little put off by that. But at one point during the psychological science degree, when we're doing all this research and, and uh, we had to take a lot of really intense statistics courses, uh, actually breaking down, like, how do you quantify behavior? And what does that look like? Um, how do you actually conduct um, clinical scientific research? And honestly, I caught the bug. Yeah. I, I remember, I'll never forget it. I remember it was like, it was like one of my first lectures. There was this dude, he's probably still there, named Simon Crow, Dr. Simon Crow at University of uh, La Trobe University. He's a psychological science professor. And he, anyway, he, he taught this, this statistics course and it totally blew my mind. And so I sort of caught the research bug and I kind of let, I kind of let that stuff go. Like the, the, the humanistic side of uh, psychology go. And I just sort of got laser focused on, on research and, and um, clinical science and stuff. And then I finished that degree. And then I worked as a clinician for a couple of years. And being in the trenches at a private hospital, watching people die, watching people recover, um, I sort of started missing some of that flavor. And then that was when I moved back to the States and it just was the weirdest thing. I ended up, uh, I had some friends that were living in Seattle and I found out that there was a, there was a master's degree in psychology in Seattle. So I wanted, I wanted to do masters Hmm. and I went and did this masters and it was, it's like one of the only, there's like three of them in the country that have that sort of, uh, like a credentialed master's degree where you can be a psychotherapist, but they specifically have that sort of bent. Yeah. It's like one of three. It's Seattle University Existential Phenomenological Psychology Program. And so I ended up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's a long way of saying like, I started with that sort of philosophy. I became sort of enamored with clinical science and, and statistics and all this stuff. Went 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 back to that and was trained as an existential phenomenological psychotherapist for whatever two years and and you know we can talk about this later but now i'm back in a a different space so right anyway yeah i mean i I think you need both right like i i feel i don't want to be i feel like i sort of really front loaded or backloaded that question with like (laughs) heaps of cynicism, right? And I mean, I I, I certainly appreciated um, my experience with statistics and research methods and all that sort of stuff, namely because Mm. it helps you read research, which, you know, can credit the way you work with an experience with with an individual one-on-one. I suppose if you want to become a statistician, that's a different profession, right? But I think what I love about what you're saying is, You've got you've got the research. You sort of ground in that research, so w- there are ways to um, understand human behavior from an observational perspective. Uh, but also, I think it's really good because it helps you um, operationalize definitions. You know, it helps. Right. With, I, I really found that that my grad dip helped me um, speak and think really more than anything. Like, what are we right. actually talking about here? Do we agree on this definition? Is there reliability and validity to this? If so, then where is yeah. it going to lead us? N- knowing that we're both yeah. talking about the same thing, right? But yeah, I love how 
you then sort of found this existential master's degree, which <laughs> to be honest with you, when I read that, man, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm teetering on this like edge of envy and inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. It was, um, I, I, I have no regrets. I mean, well, I think my only regret from that the two years, and we can talk about that program or whatever, the training and whatever, we can talk about that sort of paradigm and psychotherapy. I'd love to talk about it. I have a lot of the books on my shelf. Um, I think that it taught me the art of psychotherapy. It taught me the art of how to really be with somebody who is so burdened by pain and how to, it's, it, it also, it taught me how to be with somebody that's in, in extremis and pain and confusion without, without trying to impose my idea of what a solution is on their life. So there's, there's sort of a epistemological humility that is like, you know, driven into you when you're in a program like that. And so I loved it. You know, we, we read, you know, we read Kierkegaard and, and, you know, I wrote this, I wrote one of my, one of my final uh, theses on, on Heidegger, which I don't know if you know who Heidegger is like impossible to read, but you know, all this stuff. And um, it was an, it was an unbelievable experience, but you know, it was so funny. So, you know, for the end of the program, you have to, you know, you have to write this, like this final milestone paper is like a thesis or whatever. And by the time the program was over, I had done 600 hours in an inpatient, uh, an inpatient substance use facility where people were in crisis and dying all of the time. And I kind of had this thing where I was rebelling a little bit against the, the methodology of the program because I was working with people that, that needed intervention and they needed intervention so badly that they were they could they could die if, if I didn't provide some sort of real meaningful intervention. So my entire thesis was about trying to find the line between that sort of non-directive approach, that sort of humility, the sort of allowing the other person to unfold in front of you, to try to find the balance between that and do you curse on this? I completely love where this is going because I think there's this really interesting dichotomy between being overly directive, almost like a coach where it's point A to B outcomes all the time. Right. right. But you know, Heidegger's point, um, and he's so hard to read, but as soon right. as you try to impose an outcome, you're no longer being with the phenomenological experience of someone else. Right. And that right. stuff to me is like, to, you said before, like the art of psychotherapy, that's the yep. beauty of this, this profession where, when you can tap into the the beingness, you know, of mm. what it's like to be with someone also thrown into these experiences of life, you just in flow, you know, you that that is that's that heavenly aspect of the profession. But it's also to your point, Aaron, like just to completely um um go on the back of what you're saying, like as soon as you're trying to impose an outcome, you've lost that beingness. And yet at the same time, sometimes mm. people really need direction. So it's a tough right. dichotomy to balance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think my advisor at the time was, uh, I remember, I, you know, I kept sending him drafts of my thesis as it, you know, as it got closer. And I think he, <laughs> I think he didn't know what to do because I was, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't shitting on what we were doing. You know, I thought what we were doing was really cool and really important, but I was like, I don't know, man, I, maybe I was just younger then, but I was like making an argument for, um, sometimes, sometimes 
I need to be able to be honest. Like, like there, there, like there, there might be a client that is just driving towards the edge of a cliff. It is so painfully obvious to me and everybody in their life, except for them, that they're, they're about to drive off a, a fucking cliff, you know? And, and, um, and that's important. You still want to hold space for that. You still want to allow them to experience this impending mistake or whatever that they might be making without feeling ashamed or without feeling judged. But, um, so anyway, yeah, I was sort of trying to thread this needle of like, at what point do I say, pull, pull the brake, dude, right. this is insane, you know? Um, so yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's been a weird, it's been a weird couple of years, um, trying to marry that sort of philosophy where I was originally trained with, you know, now I, I received completely different my, my training now is, is completely different, but, um, but yeah, no, I do, I do love it and I use it. I still use it to this day. I still use it even when the sort of stuff I'm doing now. I, so I, I do love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. I think, you know, one thing that I, you know, to still man the, the psych science approach to, to therapy is that, we do have an understanding or, you know, to some degree, a universal understanding of what constitutes better health outcomes. You know, we can just look mm. at the research and go ABC equals X, Y, Z. If this occurs, you know, this is, this is a good thing. Right. right? And lo and behold, the um, third wave sort of cognitive behavioral movements where you have these maladaptive thoughts and behaviors. And then if we address those maladaptive thoughts and behaviors, well then, they no longer exist and the feelings are better, <laughs> but it, yeah. it it takes away from so much of the experience of being alive that I think you and I are speaking to, which was the thing I do want to put words in your, about, in, your, in your mouth, Aaron, but do you feel that you sort of, because I certainly did, you sort of fell through the cracks of what tertiary education could offer you in terms of, you know, philosophy is this art form that really to me is where this beauty lies. And yet, the way to actually become a therapist is what I really want to do means following this very detached statistical research route, you know? So where's yeah. the place? And I suppose this is why I was so envious of the master's degree you were able to, um, to move through. It's like, where's that place where we can marry the, the hard and the soft in psychology? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going through it right now. I really am. Um, I, I'll give you, I can give you an example. Yeah. I think that um, I think that we need to we need to have competency across different modes of or different different sort of buckets of skills um, in order to be most effective. I, so here's an example. So, so I, you know, I did that masters and that was my training. That was how I was trained as a psychotherapist. The only, at that point in my life, you know, 2020, I think I graduated. Yeah. That was the only uh, training I'd ever had. Right. And then, uh, and I, but I had had a lot of other clinic, you know, I did 600 hours at an inpatient facility. I, I'd had a lot of pretty good uh, clinical training and so anyway, I, I ended up getting into this, this, uh, this PhD that I'm in now in clinical psychology at a big, uh, a big level one trauma center, like a teaching hospital uh, on the West Coast in, in Portland. Mm -hmm. So I got into this program and, um, you know, when it started being time for me to do my different, you do different clinical rotations every year, each rotation is 12 months. Uh, I sat down with my clinical advisors because I, you know, I have, I'm in a neuroscience lab, but my primary advisor doesn't know anything about clinical. So my research is like, she has, she doesn't know anything about clinical work. So I have these other clinical advisors. Right. So I sat down with them and, and I told them about my training and, you know, sort of my existential phenomenological background. And they're like, yeah, no, that's super cool. But here's what you should do, Aaron you should spend the next 12 months doing whatever is the opposite of that. 
and I didn't maybe like to hear that at the time, but there, but there's sort of that, the wiser sort of part of me was like, that's on the money. That's exactly what I need to do. Yeah. I need to, I need to lean into whatever I don't, whatever I'm critical of. So I got this placement. So my first placement was in the, it's an outpatient treatment in the department of psychiatry at the hospital. So it's actually, it's a psychiatry clinic at the hospital with this woman who is a CBT aficionado. Mm. She just does CBT. Uh, And I think I thought at the time, like, man, this is going to be, this is going to be so whatever, I don't know, so boring or or whatever, but, but I need to be, I need to be competent in all these different skills. Anyway, to make a long, to make a long story short, here's an example. I, I spent 12 months. I had this patient. I will remember this patient for the rest of my life. I utilized approximately 0% of my existential phenomenological training with this woman. And I did the most unbelievable work I've ever done in my life wow. with this woman. And I, I can, if you'd like to hear about this case, it's a yeah, place, very, please. so this woman is, um, I'll, I'll make it, uh, you know, I'll make it de-identifiable, whatever. but th- this woman, you know, she lives on the West coast and, uh, she's like in her late sixties and used to be a high flying corporate executive. So she used to make, I don't know, like whatever, a, lo- a lot of money. And she was a high flying corporate executive around the age of 30. She had this sort of, as far as we can tell, totally spontaneous, horrifying descent into really, really crippling obsessive compulsive disorder and, um, and agoraphobia. Right. So she had, she had something called, I had never seen this before. She had something called range anxiety. I swear to God. This woman used to be super, really smart, really successful. She's still really smart. Uh, She could not drive more than four or five miles away from her house. And if she did, she would load her entire car up with two weeks of provisions. Wow. Her entire car would be stocked with, with canned goods, water mm. backpacks full of hiking gear all this stuff and uh and mm. she had over the course of 30 years of this had become a hermit she yep. hadn't used an elevator in 35 years she hadn't been in a parking garage in 35 years she hadn't flown in an airplane in 35 years and her life was in shambles mm. and when she came to us she had never got psychotherapy before wow and by I just I just finished with her a couple months ago. Um, by the time our treatment was over, she had flown on an airplane five times. She had taken a train to Seattle. She had spent countless hours doing exposure therapy uh, in in parking garages. And I completed my work with her, knowing knowing almost nothing about her childhood and yeah. each session in each session, just being purely like boom, 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 boom. What's your homework for the week? We're exposure, exposure, exposure. Anyway. So I did prolonged exposure therapy with this woman. Um, and, and it, it was just unbelievable. And uh, anyway, I'm sort of rambling, but, but my point is I had, I had patients like her, right. but then I had, uh, I had other patients that were younger that didn't have as severe problems. And that was where I got to sort of tap into my other training, the sort of more phenomenological training and did some really amazing work with, for example, some young women that have eating disorders mm. and got to sort of really just lean into the, the, the openness of that with them. So yeah, you, you see what, you see what I'm saying? 
I do. And, and I think this is a really important point too. I think, uh, you know, my natural bias is to be a little bit evangelical when it comes to the phenomenological work, you know, because that's probably what helped me the most um, in, in my 20s. So I lean on it and I sort of see the world through that lens, you know. So we, we, we obviously have these natural biases. But to your point, especially when someone is that severe with their OCD, it, it really is about addressing those maladaptive behaviors, right? And, and being very, very, as you say, like boom, 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 right? Homework, let's just press the exposure even just a little bit in between now and next week. You know, we might not be even able to get down to a, a parking garage, but we might be able to look at a photo of one for, for 30 seconds right. and build on right. that, yes. you know? Yes, um, yes. Which is so important. It's so important. But I think there's, there's, there's a there's a time and a place for both, right? To to use the word range 100%. in a different context. I think yeah. that's where therapists really need to develop a range of different yeah. therapeutic approaches and existential phenomenological approaches being one of those uh, effective processes. So it's yeah. um that's awesome, man. And it's such a beautiful experience to 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 be to be with someone going through that and then to sort of round off the work at the end and, and looking back on how the years have been for, for each other. And it's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was finished. I had a couple of patients like that at the time and, you know, finishing up and it was so hard not to lose it, you know, just it's the last session, you know, we're wrapping it up and I have to be professional, you know, my advisors over here with her, with her, with her, uh, her screen turned off, but I, you know, I know she's there and, and I'm having to be having to keep it together, you know, but yeah. So one of the other things I was, um, really hoping to hear about more is this PhD research that you're doing. <laughs> this yeah. takes us into like another area of shared interest as well. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about this, man. Yeah. Where to start? Oh man, there, there are so there are like three different buckets happening in my PhD that I think would probably all interest you, okay. uh, some more than others. Oh man, where do I start? So, okay, I'll I'll start with my research, but I think you're gonna also you're gonna really want to probably hear about the the clinical rotations I have right now. Awesome. Um, both of them, I think you'll want to hear about it. Um, so anyway, so my research is, so I'm at, uh, I'm at Oregon Health and Science University, which is a very large uh, uh, level one trauma center, like a teaching hospital in Berlin. Right. It's, it's like, um, it's like Portland's version of like a Johns Hopkins or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that type of thing. Not as big as, I mean, Hopkins is huge, but it's kind of like that. And um yeah, so I'm I'm you know I'm here I'm here for five years um, I'm three years in uh, or I'm you know I'm in my third year and I got admitted I mean first of all these clinical psychology PhD programs are just just brutally cutthroat in America it is absolutely astonishing how diff there's way harder than med school to get in way harder than law school it is. And I think it's because of the licensure, you know, I, I don't know. But anyway, I, I got admitted to this program uh, after doing a handful of years of research and publishing some papers at University of Washington. Yeah, I was working in epidemiology at the time. And oh, nice. uh, yeah, so at the time I was doing decision making research, which is um, I was I was really what I was doing is behavioral economics research. So if you've ever heard of uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Good book. Uh, he's sort of one of the godfathers of behavioral economics. That is the the ballpark of, of sort of where I'm at. So I got admitted to the translational neuroeconomics lab. And it, basically what we do is we, part of what we do is we sort of make mathematical models of people's decision-making habits under different constraints or in different circumstances. And so in particular, what, what we do in my lab is we do substance use research in humans or uh, uh, 
rodents. I don't do the, my advisor does the rodent. I don't do that. Yeah. So I study substance use disorders, particularly right now I'm writing, I'm getting ready for my dissertation. I'm studying um, relapse, but the, the, the primary sort of, um, I suppose the, the primary sort of variable that we study is something called delay discounting. Uh, what's the simplest way to work that in? So, okay. So if you like a, in like an undergraduate psychology program, a lot of times people will have like a brief lecture on the marshmallow test. Oh, yes. You remember that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's okay, like a great. trigger of success, right? To postpone gratification. Right, exactly. So the marshmallow test is is the most sort of elementary, basic way to understand what delay discounting is. Delay discounting is sort of you are uh, you're choosing a uh, well. If you're impulsive, you choose a smaller, sooner reward over a larger, later reward. And the farther away from you temporally, like, you know, on a timeline, the farther away from you something gets, the less you value it. So, you know, $100 a month from now is sort of subjectively worth about $20 to me today. Mm, you know what I mean? Mm, mm. And delay discounting is, uh, there's been some really unbelievable genome-wide association studies that have sort of found uh particular sort of um, genetic mutations that appear to be responsible for that trait. Yeah. And it also appears to be heritable and delayed discounting is, there's a insane amount of research on how predictive high levels of delayed discounting is for various psychiatric disorders. Interesting. And, Obviously, the easiest one to understand is addiction. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's like, it's, it's almost too easy. It's like, if I am addicted to uh, heroin or alcohol, what happens is as the stimulus uh, of alcohol or heroin, as I get closer to relapse. So this is sort of my dissertation. Okay, imagine that imagine that I just got out of a treatment facility. I've been sober for 30 days. Prior to me going into the treatment facility, I experienced 10 years of absolute horror. Let's say I'm a heroin addict and it was just 10 years of pure misery. Maybe I'm homeless. Maybe I lost my kids. Maybe I lost my wife. Maybe I lost my job. I've got 10 years of just abject misery at the hands of addiction. I go to treatment. I get 30 days of sobriety under my belt. I go to a place like Malvern Private Hospital, which is so successful at doing this. And uh, I go to treatment. I get out. And now I've got 30 days under my belt mm. of, of the first modicum of peace and reprieve. I've experienced in a very long time. And I, actually, I can actually give you a perfect example. This is a true story. So one of my best friends is a recovering heroin addict. He's actually, he's an incredible filmmaker and um, he's been sober now for a long time, but he was a, he's a recovering heroin addict. He tells this really beautiful story that, that actually was part of what inspired me to do my dissertation the way that I designed it. He was, uh, he was, he was in a 12 step program and he was coming off of heroin. He'd been off of heroin for like, I don't know, a couple months or something like that. And he was living in Seattle. He's in downtown Seattle, three months off of heroin. And he's going to the bus stop in downtown Seattle. It, <laughs> it on, on Pike and Pine, anybody who's ever been to Seattle knows what I'm talking about on the corner of Pike and Pine Pine. It's a pretty, pretty sketchy. I see. Anyway, He's three months sober. He gets to the bus stop and everything in his life is going better. He got a job. His family trusts him. Uh, he's feeling physically better. He's not going through withdrawals anymore. He doesn't have to take methadone every day. Everything in his life is getting better. Every metric of quality of life is improved. 
and he's walking down the street, he's getting on the bus and a guy comes up to him and, and some sketchy guy comes up to him and he goes, Hey man, um, do you want any tar? Just code, code for heroin. He goes, do you want any tar? And my friend goes, yeah, yeah, I do. Bang. 30 minutes later, he's shooting heroin in the bathroom of a 7-Eleven. Wow. And so what I'm trying to understand is where, what is happening to, how are those memories being discounted? Mm -hmm. Because he has X amount of years of, of memory stores of the, the horrifying physical and emotional pain of addiction. And he's now he's got this more recent set of memory stores looking at uh, or sort of experiencing, man, this is everything in my life is so much better. But something happens that as you take that stimulus of the drug of choice, as it gets closer and closer and closer, it becomes more and more salient. What happens is all of those memories are neutralized. We don't know. They're either neutralized or they're modified, whether they're neutralized or modified or whatever they are not accessible in a way to be able to leverage behavior change. Mm -hmm. He can't mm -hmm. tap into that in that moment. He cannot tap into it. And it's the myopia. There's an area of research that's unbelievable called alcohol myopia theory. It's absolutely fascinating. And there's sort of this myopia that comes over the person and then all they can think about is the drug and, and they can't access those memory stores. Right. Anyway, Sorry, that's a very long-winded way of, of concise or explaining that that is my current line of research. That's that's what I right. do right now. But it's, it is fascinating because I think, you know, in that moment, I think this is the really difficult thing about living well is that mm -hmm. you always have to contend with feelings of sort of boredom, slight discontent, you know. I mean, yeah. the way that, I mean eating healthily, right? You know, depending yeah. on how you do it, intermittent fasting, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. We we know now that we're never going to quite feel as good as when we were just stuffing our face with chips or when we had that right. high from heroin or, you know, what that, that right. puff of like, I mean, even for me, right, as an example, um, my partner, Siobhan, remember Siobhan? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, she has really bad endometriosis. Okay. And um, she takes a, a, a THC pen um, because mm -hmm. CBD didn't really do much, but THC, do, you know, works really effectively for her. Yeah. And we can even notice the slight dopaminergic edge that offers, you know, the sort of, oh, you know, do you want to have a hit tonight? That sort of thing where it's like you, you, you feel just those little moments where you know that the part of you and THC is, you know, obviously it's decriminalized. So, you know, thank God for that. Um, it's a different ballpark than sort of, you know, what, what heroin does in comparison to baseline, you right. know, all sort of, but it's still the same framework. Right. And I just wonder if perhaps you would know more about this, Aaron, but th those two systems of thinking that Kahneman offered, you know, system one, system two, you've got, mm -hmm. we're always contending with the impulsive part of us that wants survival now, really, if you think about it from mm -hmm. an evolutionary perspective, but then also yeah. the other part of us that knows that to, continue to survive and to flourish and so on requires not getting the thing that we want right now. And, right. and again, this is a dichotomy, you know, the, right. the human experience is a paradox because we're always having to manage these dichotomies. Do you feel that this is ever going to be something that's going to be overcome or understood or is it, is it always going to be a balancing act? I, I think that, I think that there is no limit to there is no limit to technological advances in psychopharmacology. So I don't know. I don't know what uh, pharmacology can come up with. But I will say in general, you know, on the whole, I think it is I think it is always going to be a balancing act and I think that um, so there's um, in in this area of research, sort of what you're talking about. There is uh, there's a 
relatively new area of sort of behavioral economic research that is part of my dissertation uh, that has proven to be uh, have pretty robust um, uh, reductions in impulsivity and delayed delay discounting. It's called episodic future thinking. And episodic future thinking is, it really is basically a clinical intervention where you sit with a clinician and you pick uh, four different time intervals in the future. And what you do is you, this is assuming that somebody is, is trying to not do heroin anymore, right? Somebody's tr treatment seeking that they're, they're in an inpatient or outpatient clinic. And you pick four different uh, intervals in the future. So it could be three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, maybe 18 months from now. And what you do is you, you sort of walk through with the clinician. There was sort of this question that you can pose to people in, sub in early stages of substance use treatment, which is how good could it possibly get for you? Beautiful. And you have the individual marinate on the, their potential self in, realistic, in a realistic sort of time parameter. So three months from now, let's say I work, I, some of my work is with veterans. Let's say three months from now, you, you go through with your treatment, you adhere to all of your treatment goals, you abstain from heroin, blah, blah, blah. What could realistically happen? I might be able to go to my, my daughter's birthday party in October. That'd be cool. Maybe I can get, maybe I can get a, a court date and maybe I can get um, uh, custody on the weekends. Maybe that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, tell me more about that. How would it feel for you if you got to go to your daughter's birthday party in October? What are some of the smells that you might smell? What, what might that look like? Where might the party be? And you really have them sort of really just, yeah, like I said, marinate in, in, in that possible self. And you do that over different time intervals. And it seems to be that doing that has drastic reductions in the sort of impulsive smaller sooner need this now self yeah um so anyway yeah that's just there's sort of these there are these sort of pathways that we can manipulate cognitively to help sort of you can sort of develop a methodology to get somebody to actually consider these these things in a way that they just can't do on their own. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think I like that as well because you've, you've got, you know, you, you spoke about the, the increasing salience of what it would be like for an, for a heroin addict to just be able to grab hold of that tar, so to speak, and shoot up in a 7-Eleven so quickly. But instantly, if you've been really working through this episodic future envisioning basically or future journaling yeah, yeah. exercise or whatever it is right yeah. you've got something to buffer against that 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 impulse you know yeah and and, and the more you've uh, marinated as you say on this idea of who you could be essentially perhaps even emphasized or augmented with who you might be if things don't change right so you've got something to run right. towards and something to run away from right it, it, it just buffers that and adds more time between stimulus and response which is yeah. strange, right? Because it sounds so simple. You know, think yeah. about who you yes. could be, right? And right. think about who you might be if things don't change, right? You're yeah. running away from fear, you're running towards purpose or pleasure. It sounds so easy, <laughs> but it, it, it works. Right, right, yeah. And, and, and all of the research so far in this area has focused on episodic future thinking. And what me and my advisor did for my dissertation, which we haven't, we're still doing it, is we created something that, I, I sort of coined this phrase episodic retrospection, mm -hmm. which is um, all of the research is on delay discounting in the future and all of the research is on episodic future thinking. And there is almost no research on what is on what would be termed in behavioral economics past discounting, which is very ob obvious and simple, but like nobody has researched it, which is like, man, what is happening that we as human beings have this 
just this unbelievable failure of integrating past negative experience and updating our priors based on past negative experience in the same way that you would if you touch a hot stove, you learn very quickly to not touch a hot stove. But when it comes, when there's reward involved, particularly the type of dopaminergic reward of a shot of heroin or something like that, human beings are just reliably terrible at, at being able to integrate what has happened in the past. And so what we want to do is we want to have a more holistic intervention where we walk somebody through what was happening three months ago. What did the trap house look like? What did the carpet look like? What did the mm. abscess on your arm look like? How did that feel? Six months ago, how about that? Nine months ago, how about that? 12 months ago, how about that? And I think that, and so that's what I've developed is, is I think that looking towards the future is really important, but I think integrating the past is equally as important. And I think that in clinical science, we're, we are, we're afraid to, shame is not always a negative emotion or shame is not always a useless emotion, maybe is a better way of putting it. There's a place for shame. Um, it doesn't mean that we need to berate our patients into changing, but I think that what I, I think that sometimes in clinical science, we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And so I've sort of developed this protocol that I think will be, I think we'll re revisit this in five years, but you know, I think that it would be more impactful to have to walk somebody through the entire temporal window. What was going on back here? Where are you now? And where could you be in doing that in a systematic way and doing it repeatedly and seeing if that has any change in, in, in cognition? I'd, I'd love to, to follow along with that. Um, I, I don't see how, I, I feel like the only variable that that would have an effect on that is the strength of the therapeutic relationship. Right. You know, I think if you guys have a really great bond and yes. you've padded that experience with context and the, the client knows what's about to happen, right. but then you're on the same team. We're using right. shame for their self-becoming as opposed to just yes. top-down shaming them without any warning. Right. <laughs> well, well, so this is actually to your point earlier, which is, I'm going to, so I'm going to start enrolling people in that study, like in the next couple of months, which means that I'm going to have to go to a local, either the, either it will be at the VA veterans hospital, or it's going to be at this other place. That's uh, just a general treatment facility. And I'm going to have to go and I'm going to have to sit with patients and I'm going to have to do that. Well, guess what training is going to be most useful right. Right. for that clinical intervention. Totally. Because if I, if I walked into that session with those people and I approached it like a Skinner yeah. behaviorist, uh, like a, treating them like a mouse on a wheel, yeah. there is going to be a, a shockingly horrible experience for them. This guy just came in and made me feel like dog shit and he thinks it's going to help me. He thinks it's going to help me, you know get sober or whatever. <laughs> it keeps telling so, me to marinate in things. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Stick your nose in it, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And so I'm just really passionate about that. You know, I think that, um, yeah, so that, so yeah, that's, that's, um, but if you want, you know, I could tell you about this other stuff that's, that's, uh, going on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it, man. Cause I know I got to get you out here at some point. Um, but I think, uh, if ever we cross paths physically, we'll, we'll have to grab a coffee and uh, get the dopamine hit and just record, but that uh, will definitely get you back on the show, man. But yeah, tell me about some of the other research. Oh my God. Um, was well, specifically a, there's, you're doing work in psychedelic psychotherapy, I, I think. Yes, I am. So, but, so there's, there's two different things that I'm doing right now. So I have, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going into this new, 12 month cycle of, of practicum, like clinical rotations. And I have two different ones. They're both very interesting. One of them, I'm at the social neuroscience and effective psych psychology, the snap lab at OHSU, which is one of the leading psychedelic science labs in the country. Uh, so I'm in there, but then I'm also 
I'm also in a chronic pain lab with a man who prior to being a clinical psychologist was a traveling like a Vedic monk wow. for 12 years and spent some time with Ram Das in the right. 70s and um, actually ended up giving up his robes to uh, to come back to graduate school. And he did a PhD in clinical psychology working alongside John Kabat-Zinn at Duke. Wow. And he's my clinical advisor for the next 12 months. And he does trauma therapy and yoga therapy and uh, mindfulness-based therapy for people with chronic pain. And one of the interesting things that I'm learning about this, so I sought this guy out. Once I realized that he was available to me as an advisor, I, 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 he referred me a client at a different thing and I saw some of his case notes and, I, and some of his case notes were talking about surrender and even mm. mentioning the word God and talking about mindfulness and all this in breath work. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> exactly. And so I sought him out and I actually dropped, I, anyway, I sought him out. And so one of the things that we're realizing is that, and we'll only have a couple minutes here, but like for this thing, mm. we are in chronic pain, probably 75% of our patients have chronic pain that is destroying their life that has no neurological or physiological correlate to explain the pain that would show up on an MRI. Essentially, 75% of these people to the untrained eye are having like the phantom pain right. that's destroying their life. So a good example of this is, is fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. chronic regional pain syndrome these sort of pain things that destroy people's lives, but that you, you can do all the tests in the world. You can't figure out what is actually physiologically going on with them. And so what we're doing with these people is we're doing EMDR, uh, deep somatic trauma therapy to anyway, there's, there's a, I try not to go off on a tangent about it, but, but basically what we're doing is, we're understanding that the vast majority of these people with chronic pain have some fairly severe history of trauma in their lives. Right. It right. hasn't been processed. Isn't so it comes to that, that whole thing of like the body keeps the score and like those, those sorts of things. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm doing right now. Mm. It's it. Well, see, that's more research. I really love to, um, you know, be kept in the loop with because, one of the interesting things about endometriosis is that oftentimes mm. a lot of women, and I think some men actually get endometriosis too, but a lot of women will go and have the surgery to have it removed and yet the pain mm. remains. You know, so Siobhan's mm. on a chronic long-term pain management protocol as opposed yeah. to it being sort of solved. You know, speaking yeah. to the phantom limb syndrome, I remember reading about that where yeah. veterans will have their arms and legs blown off or something and yet have tremendous pain. And part mm -hmm. of the therapy is sort of like, putting a mirror here as if the right arm is the left arm and then slowly working through the pain through yeah. movement and things. Isn't that fascinating? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. There's, I, I, yeah, I won't go off on a tangent about it. We can, I can, we'll I can send time. you some, I can send you some papers about it, but, but, yeah. um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, by the way, tell Shabon to look, look, Dr. Jim Carson. Dr. Jim Carson, awesome. We'll Absolutely, do. she should look it up if she's going through that. But, but um, so that that's part of what's going on. It's fascinating, and it, it basically just comes down to uh, the, the 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 relationship between pain and trauma is far more mysterious yeah. than we could ever have predicted. And so we're trying to treat it at the root. We're addressing the trauma. And hoping that that will loosen some of that up. But uh, right. yeah. Right. Um, wow. Yeah. Hey, 
so good to hang out again, dude. Yeah, absolutely. So fun. Absolutely. We'll have to yeah, do it man. again. I think uh, when you're not overly bombarded with uh, about 19 different dissertations and 17 PhDs. <laughs> I know, I know. I feel bad. I didn't even get to tell you about this, the psychedelic science stuff, but. Um, <laughs> no, that's all good. We'll, we'll, it'll yeah. be a uh, to be continued open loop for the listeners. Right on. And in, in the meantime, I'll send you, I'll send you one paper about psychedelic science that, that has not everything that you need to know, but it's, it's uh, yeah. Check in with me again in, in like a year or two and I'll be pretty deep into the psychedelic science research and we can, we can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Cool. All right, Aaron. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and guys, as always, thank you for listening. I'll speak to you next week.